Okay. All right, I am Eric Halivni. I'm sitting here with Lee Corman. Uh, I'm going to be talking about his father, Max. It is, we're in Cleveland. It is December 4th, 2017. Uh, why don't we step, take a step back and uh, go back to the beginning. And if you, and you, if you could tell me a little bit about, uh, did, you, did you know your grandparents? I know my grandparents they're just a, a little bit, I would say. They're, they were pretty old relative to those days uh, when I became aware of them. Uh, so I only knew them slightly and for a very few years. Do you know where they were from? Yeah, they're both, both of our, my families, uh, my parents' families came from the Warsaw area. They didn't know each other there, but they met here in Cleveland. So but in Warsaw in those days was, was, the, was not just the city, it was a sort of a big area surrounding what we know now as the city. So your grandparents met in Cleveland? In Cleveland, correct. No, no, my, my, my parents did. Your parents met? Yeah, my par both my parents were born in the Warsaw area, mm -hmm. came over with their parents, uh, my grandparents, at about the turn of the century. When, <coughs> when was your father born? Father was born in, uh, I think, 1897, probably. Yeah. And when did they come to Cleveland? I think about 1905, my recollection. Yeah. And uh, so he grew up then, basically, in, in uh, it, Cleveland. He was a kid when he when Yeah, he, he, he was a kid here, and he grew up, both of them grew up here in, in Cleveland. Uh, I question them from time to time, not enough about their recollections of life in uh, in Poland, uh, but I I don't have any memories myself of what they told me. I, I know a little bit about it from a cousin of mine, but not not much. Where Where did your father go to high school or, or school? Or elementary yeah, school, they school? both went to public school here in Cleveland. Uh, my father went to. A, place called East High. Uh, he was very, uh, uh, very athletic, natural athlete. So uh, he played big basketball. Even later, after he was married, he played semi-pro basketball and earned money. He used to get paid five dollars a game. <coughs> he was a big, tough guy, so he occupied a lot of space. I don't know what a good shooter he was. <laughs> and, uh, and he was a handball champion here in the city, actually. So, yeah. Did he go to, did he go to college? He didn't go to college. He, he uh, got married, I don't know, when they got married, but he's very young. Uh, and uh, he got a job. He worked for the old Cleveland Trust Bank, became high up, high clerk, but he knew that he was never going to be a manager because the owner of the bank was a guy who made it very clear that no Jews were going to be owner, be managers of his bank. So he uh, he went to Knight Law School, didn't go to college, but he graduated from uh, Knight Law School, Baldwin Wallace Law School, now part of Cleveland State, and, uh, in 1918. And I actually have his uh, his certificate from the Supreme Court showing that, or not not Supreme Court, but from Baldwin Wallace, showing that he got his his uh, law degree in 1918. But he didn't have to go to college in those days, and so he went to Knight Law School while he worked at the bank, and he became a lawyer in 1918. And then he joined his brother, who had already gone to law school, a younger brother, Joe. And they formed a law firm, Corman and Corman, and that actually is the start of this firm, where you're sitting now. So this firm's going to celebrate its hundredth anniversary next year, wow. <laughs> as a result of my father and my is, uncle. Is that one of the older Cleveland law firms? I'd probably one of the older. Yeah, it'd be one of the older Cleveland law firms, but uh, certainly maybe the oldest identifiably Jewish law firm, though there are not many 
law firm is there to, uh, just Jewish now because Jewish law graduates can get a job anywhere. <laughs> so, yeah. were they were they uh, traditional? Yeah, my parents and my grandparents kept a Jew a, or a kosher home. Uh, and we made you know Shabbat or Friday night. Uh, my father rode on Sabbath, played golf every Saturday of his adult life. So, were they affiliated with a synagogue? Yeah, Park Synagogue. They're, they're classic conservative Jews. Uh, my father had a great voice, so he could dob it better than most Hausens he ran into. <laughs> so, you know, he, he liked going. He went to shul every Saturday morning. And of course, on holidays, and uh, and uh, I guess he must have learned it all in uh, some cheder in, in in Warsaw because he, he sure knew his stuff. Did he, did he go to like uh, an afternoon school or uh, anything here? I don't know, but I doubt it. I think he went to work as soon as he got off the boat, uh, and. Uh, my grandmother on my father's side was a seamstress and she had made a living for her family in Warsaw and then she continued here in Cleveland. She's a very strong lady. Uh, my mother's mother was classic Jewish housewife. Her father, her, her husband was a furrier and uh, made women's fur coats. My paternal grandfather was a uh, uh, carpenter, though I don't think he worked very much. I think he was sick pretty much all the time he was here. And he died relatively young. Uh, though they both had large families. I had many aunts and uncles. Uh, not many cousins. They weren't very prolific, actually. But uh, a goodly number of cousins. Uh, and I, I knew my aunts and uncles very well. And of course my cousins. When were you born? I was born in 1927. Lived in Cleveland all my life. Well, what, uh, what date? 1927? September 2nd. And, uh, and where were you living when you... I was living in Cleveland Heights. My family had moved up from where in Cleveland, Cleveland Heights. Cleveland Heights on, uh, I think, uh, uh, I used to know the street. It was off Mayfield Road, uh, but then very young, 1927, we were just a few years away from the Depression, and uh, and of course during those ten years, my family moved a lot. As they, uh, like many families of middle and lower middle class, my father made his living as a lawyer, but it was tough. So. Uh, during those years, I say we moved a number of places in Cleveland Heights. Where'd you go to school? Cleveland Heights High, to, oh, and, and all the all the all the the uh, public schools in Cleveland Heights. Elementary school was. Uh, Elementary went to Coventry, and before that, I'd gone to Taylor Road School, then Coventry Elementary and Roosevelt Junior High School. None of these schools exist anymore, unfortunately, and uh, and then I went to Cleveland Heights High. That still exists, and uh, from then I went off to college. So, uh, and I, I, uh, my siblings were. Maybe I'm getting ahead of you, but I had uh, three brothers and a sister. Uh, only my sister survives now. An older sister. You that what place were you in the family? I was. Uh, I was the third son. I think my mother had a number of uh, uh, births that didn't survive childhood, common in those days. And, uh, and I had a younger brother who died about three or four, aged about three or four. And then uh, two older brothers, uh, one who uh, 
who, who uh, was lost in action in the Second World War, Brother Howard, and an older brother, Robert, who lived in Chicago as a child analyst, child psychoanalyst. And uh, he was a, uh, he was a strong scientist. Also, he wanted to, had signed up actually when he was in college to go to uh, Palestine to join the the uh, Haganah, but he had gained a little notoriety in college, and he was on a film protesting the British mandate. So the Brits wouldn't; they denied him a passport. Really? So he couldn't go there, and uh, he. Uh, Yeah, so uh, he didn't go to Israel. He couldn't get in. He couldn't get into Palestine then. And then he went off <clears throat> other places. Had he served uh, in, in World War II? Yeah, and he, he also served. One brother, my oldest brother was lost. He was lost in the European, actually off in North Africa. And then my brother Robert, Bob, he uh, came a, uh, went to medical school and was a uh, Field surgeon went through a number of island campaigns. He was in harm's way, definitely. And then he came back to Cleveland briefly, and then went to Chicago and lived there for the rest of his life as a child analyst. And um, were, you born, were you born in Mount Sinai? Absolutely. Born in Mount Sinai and. Many, many years later, was became chairman of the board. How about that? <laughs> I was, thought that was pretty neat. Yeah. When you finished high school, were you were friends of yours enlisting or going to college? Yeah, some some did enlist. Uh, I graduated in uh, '45, and the war was just coming to an end. But some some of my classmates did enlist. Uh, and uh, they, they all made it through. I went, I didn't. Uh, uh, at that point, my brother Bob was still in the Pacific. My brother Howard had already lost. Uh, whatever my inclinations were, there no way I was gonna leave my parents at that time. They were, they were devastated by my brother's death. So it's an explanation, it's not an excuse. Uh, I subsequently served in peacetime. Uh, Did you, do you remember, was uh, Zionism or Palestine or things like that talked about in your home? Totally, I think the answer is, I've, I've commented half facetiously, but mostly truthfully. And there were only two subjects that my father was really interested in. Uh, though we talked about many things at the table, but my father was mostly interested in Jewish education and in Zionism. Uh, I can't tell you uh, how, what their earliest interest in Zionism was. My father was an ardent socialist voter for every socialist candidate that ran, you know, Thomas and all the others, and uh, for president. And he, uh, so it, his Zionism may come out of his socialism, or his socialism may have come out of his, com out of his, out of his Zionism, I, I don't know. All I know is my first consciousness of it was that he was an ardent Zionist. <coughs> and, uh, and I picked up my own feelings from him. How did it translate? Was it just following the news, or? No, nah, he was. Uh, he participated in every committee, and uh, uh, within his means, he would go to national conventions of Zionists, American Zionist organization, strong in those days, and uh, 
And, uh, you know, again, within his modest means, uh, he probably gave some money. Were there, do you remember people coming through town? I, uh, I, the people who came through town, I, I don't, my memory is not of that because uh, I left, I left Cleveland to go to college when I, in, in uh, fall of 45, uh, and uh, you know, things really heated up, started to heat up right then up until the time of the uh, partition resolution in 47. <clears throat> so uh, who came to town in those days, I, I don't remember. Uh, I wouldn't have known. I, I certainly wouldn't have remembered them. But I remember some of the characters that, the characters that, that, that people who he was familiar with and talked Zionism to, like Lipsky. Uh, Lipsky is? The, the, from the American Zionist Organization, the leader. And uh, and Malcolm Goldman, and uh, of course Abba Hill of Silver, giant, lived in Cleveland. And uh, you know, and then some of the Cleveland people, obviously, uh, Edison Shapiro, man by the name of Albert Sachs, I remember him. Uh, man by the name of Sig Braverman. They're all of an intellectual Zionist group that were very close. You know, that, that where the boundaries of Jewish education and, and Zionism started, or you know, this is not clear. And and they're they're very much interested in Hebrew, you know, Hebrew language. Matter of fact, a number of them, <laughs> and I and my sister attended. Uh, for, may, may know, formed a, 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 a Hebrew school, afternoon Hebrew school called Bialik, naturally. Bialik Hebrew School, <coughs> which lasted for a handful of years, I suppose. And my sister and I went there <laughs> to Bialik Hebrew School, Remember founded by my father and a few others. And they also founded a camp, Camp Khalil, out in western Pennsylvania, where my sister and I were, were uh, counselors very briefly. We didn't go to camp. Parents couldn't afford us to send us to camp, but my sister and I were counselors. Camp Galil, very Zionist camp. Do you remember any of the teachers at Bialik? No, I don't remember them. The, you know, the, the teachers in Cleveland led the led the Jewish education in Cleveland were Libby Braverman and, and the man by the name of Nate Brilliant. And they were leaders. You may have heard their names before. And uh, they're very close friends of my parents. And they were all part of this intelligentsia, Jewish intelligentsia that met often. I remember, I, my mother liked to entertain. She liked to cook and have people over. So there was always lots of people in my, my parents' home. Uh, and uh, they are all of that cut. And uh, so th th that I remember very well, these people come. Was your father involved um, in organizations, like uh, in local organizations, yeah. educational? Yeah, he, he was very strong at Cleveland Hebrew School at that point. You know, afternoon Hebrew schools were were the natural successor of, for liberals of Yeshivot, and, or, or not, not Yeshivot, but, uh, you know, kids' schools, uh, caters. And because uh, kids were going to, public school here. And my father worked very hard for the Cleveland Haver School, was president for many years. And, and then there's an umbrella organization, it's called the Bureau of Jewish Education here in Cleveland. Marvelous word, Bureau, that's right out of, right out of socialism. <laughs> and uh, it's now against my protest, they changed the name to the Jewish Education Committee of Cleveland or Commission of Cleveland or something like that. I protested vigorously against them giving up the name Bureau. I just, I just connected it so much with my father and his friends in a time that long, long gone by. But and he, 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 he was president of Bureau of Jewish Education and Cleveland Hebrew Schools. Yeah, so that, that was his organizational life, that and American Zionist organization. Uh, were you involved in any youth movements? No. Never interesting enough. Spent all my time playing baseball, I guess. 
backyard. Did um I think you had you had said something how you thought maybe uh did you mention the Balfour Declaration and how it impacted uh well, the Balfour, De well, Balfour Declaration, 19, uh, maybe in our private conversation, Balfour Declaration in 1917, uh, I'm sure influenced my father a great deal, uh, tremendously, I'm sure, everybody. Uh, you know, he was a great fan of Herzl and, and Weizmann and, and Brandeis, all the giants, and spoke of them reverentially, spoke of them. and. Uh, so I knew I knew their names and those people, <clears throat> and subsequently, you know, became students of them. Not students of them, but but um, I learned more about their history of those men. Well, okay. Yeah, go ahead. Hmm? Yeah. So, so the Balfour Declaration was obviously the big deal, and now it's a hundred years since the Balfour Declaration. So that's interesting you know, how 100 years splits up. 1917, the Balfour Declaration, a little stop on the way, 1947, the uh, partition, 1967, Jews stepped, really stepped into the world stage and took over the land west of the Jordan River, however you want to call it, the territories are occupied or whatever you wish. And now it's 2017. Israelis have been in the territories for 50 years. <coughs> and it's 100 years since the Balfour Declaration said that we we're supposed to get along with the rest of the people there. It's ironic. Yeah. What? Do you remember the first time you heard about what was going on in Europe with the Holocaust? Or, uh... I don't. Did you still have family that lived in Europe? None. Uh, all of our family that I knew about lived in the United States except for one sister of my maternal grandmother who lived in Israel, who lived in Palestine, and my father who who knew Yiddish, both my parents spoke fluent Yiddish, was their, obviously their first language. They speak to you in Yiddish? Oh, I don't speak Yiddish. Did they speak to you in Yiddish? No, they spoke Yiddish around me. We're, we were classic, you know, and they spoke Yiddish when they didn't want the kids to understand, which was a great loss, and I mourn it continually that I didn't learn Yiddish. Uh, and uh, uh, so getting back to your question, uh, and my description of the family, the, my maternal grand mother's sister was in Palestine, went to Palestine. I don't know when, I don't know why, and I don't know the circumstances, but I met her. When I went to Israel first in 1950, uh, she lived in Petah Tikva, and my father had given me the address. You want to know what it was? I still remember. 5 Achar Ha'am Street, Petah Tikva. Achar Am Street at that point was a dirt road consisting of a number of one-room houses. And uh, Rivka Pelsman lived in one of them. And uh, it's a little getting off story, but when, but it's my father, because he, he was, fluent in Yiddish, couldn't write it, but he could read it and speak it. He uh, corresponded with Rivka. He was the, the uh, conduit of hers to the 
American family, and uh, he would send her money, either from himself or his brother-in-law, my mother's brother, who had done fairly well in business. And uh, so no one from the American family had ever visited Rebecca because no one had ever been to Palestine. And I was the first. I went there in 1950, uh, or the February of 1950. Anyhow, to, and uh, so one one Shabbat, I got a ride from my kibbutz over to uh, to, to uh, Petak Tikva. Truck was going by there, and so I figured I'd drop in on Rivka Pelzman. And uh, found five, number five Akhadam Street and knocked on the door. And this lady, I don't know how old she was, but she was a sister of my grandmother, poor, wearing a house dress, simple house dress. And then, uh, in my bad Hebrew, I asked whether she was Rivka Pelsman. And she admitted that she was. And I said, well, I'm uh, Lee Corman, son of Max Corman. I thought she was going to faint. She didn't know who I was, didn't know I was coming, didn't know I existed. Maybe my father had said he had a son. And uh, after being st totally stunned, she <laughs> took my hand and pulled me in the house, you know. And the first question, of course, was, do you speak Yiddish? Can't thread in Yiddish? I had to tell her no. Oh, she was crestfallen. She just wanted to pour out in Yiddish her language, all her feelings, and ask me questions. Everything. And here I couldn't do it. Fortunately, she had a daughter who lived across the way, and a uh, young daughter. And uh, she ran across the street, got her, and brought her over. And she spoke a little English and, and Hebrew. So with that makeshift system, we, we conversed and everything. But And uh, it, it was a memorable, memorable day. I remember it so vividly, how she loved the house, everything. And subsequently, my family, my father and my mother, actually went, went to Israel. And a number of my, my my sister, my brother, my brother was, Bob was still alive. They all went there and they visited her, and then the families connected. And then her daughter and children they came to Cleveland, stayed with us, and my wife and myself. So we connected up. But that first meeting, you know, getting back to your question, whether any um, lived that uh, any family lived outside the United States, it consisted of Rivka. So. Bless her heart. <laughs> Tell me a little bit more about that trip to, to Israel. Well, why? why? Well, the trip to Israel was that um, I went to, went to college. Where'd you go? I went to Harvard College. My older brother, Howard, who was lost in the war, he had gone to Harvard. Uh, he graduated in 1938. Uh, and uh, not bad for his eldest son of a man who had come to the United States at the turn of the century. So he was born in 17, significant year. Anyway, he graduated from uh, he graduated from college in 38. Then he went to Harvard Law School. He graduated from law school in 41. So I went to I went to Harvard, uh, partly out of interest in going to Harvard, and partly out of interest in I don't know being my brother or whatever, you know. So I went I went to college, and then I got out in uh, forty nine, and uh, actually I I. I uh, 
was interested in medical school. So I started medical school at the University of Chicago, and then I decided it wasn't for me, and so I dropped out uh, at the end of 49. And then uh, not having anything to do, I decided to go to Israel. The country had just been established in 48. So I went to Israel in 1950, <clears throat> in February of 1950, uh, and uh, ended up in a kibbutz in the Galilee, in the Canaret. Then I stayed there about a half a year, and then I uh, traveled through Europe on my way home. Father was very generous, and uh, and then so then I came back, and started law school in the fall of 1950. Uh, so that's what that's what took me to Israel, and but but my interest in Zionism, it, it, uh, besides the seeds that had been put in my head from my father and mother, uh, just politically and. Tribally, and you know, all the reasons. One was just defensive about being Jewish in those days. Uh, I, I, someone was enlisted, I can't remember how, into the uh, just newly formed, maybe I helped form it, I don't remember now, uh, Zionist club of. Harvard Zionist Club, <laughs> and I remember our, that in 1948, I believe it was 48 or 47, I can't remember exactly whether it was before or after the partition resolution, uh, we got a speaker to come up, two speakers actually, to come up and was uh, uh, to speak to our Zionist organization, or we got one. That's right, we got one, and uh, it was uh, uh, who became the foreign minister. What's his name? Brit. Abba Eben. Abba Eben. Abba Eben was our guest speaker. He was no no one to me. It was just another, no, not, not just, but it was it was another, you know, Israel wasn't Israeli yet. But, you know, Zionist speaker speaking around the country, raising support. So we got Abbe even to come to speak to, <laughs> to, uh, to our Zionist group. A real nice guy, you know. And uh, but anyhow, so I was interested in Zionism very much in those days. Uh, uh, so uh, that's connection which would have led me to go to Israel. Was there, and, was there an organization called Avuka? In, in what was the name? Avuka. That uh, it sounds uh, familiar but I can't say there was. I interviewed somebody. He's older than you. Yeah. He was born in 1921. Wow. Terre Haute, Indiana. Also went to Harvard and also went to Harvard Law School. <laughs> But he went to Harvard Law School. He had, he served uh, in the Navy in, the, in in between. Yeah. So uh, he still would have been a little bit older than you, even even after his service. Yeah. But uh, I remember him him talking about like being in being in Boston. Yeah. It was like his first exposure to some of the more uh, national kind of. Um, Zionist figures and movements, and and uh, when he was there, and I remember there was this Avuka was the name of some kind of yeah uh, could have, could have been I I didn't pay attention to him. busy being a student and so I don't know did you know anybody else who was going to visit Israel or going to not a soul I went by boat it took me two weeks to go from New York to Haifa what boat 
American something lines, I can't even remember, American, American Italian lines, something like that. It was a freighter that took some passengers. And uh, on the boat, actually, were some uh, people that had gone to my same high school, but were younger than I, and suddenly became closest to friends and our families that are married. Uh, they were ardent Zionists, they were Habanim, and they were going to settle the land. Remember their names? Yeah, with Alan and Gressel, now deceased, but became a dear friend of mine. And uh, and uh, so uh, when we landed in Israel, he went off to their kibbutz, they'd all ready. But I, uh, and a friend I'd met on the boat. Don't ask me what the name of the boat was because I can't remember it now. Uh, and uh, but the, man, the fellow I met on the boat, a fellow by the name of Zev Putterman. His father was a leading Hazan in, in New York. I can't remember what his name was. <coughs> Zev and I teamed up. So we landed in Haifa uh, in February, I can't remember the exact date, of 1950. And at that point, the worst snowstorm, in, perhaps in record, was hitting Haifa. And so we landed in an absolute blizzard of snow. It was piling up a foot of snow, two feet of snow. <clears throat> and, and Haifa was a pretty small town in that. And there wasn't much to it except a port and a few buildings going up, or houses going up the mountain. Uh, I don't know that Technion had, actually, had been established then. I'm not sure. 1950. I, uh, but mainly it was a port of entry, as you know. And then the old city of... Uh, Jaffa was, Jaffa, yeah. And that, of course, was a medieval town, or, yeah. So it was interesting. But, uh, so, so we spent the first night in uh, in uh, Haifa and uh, wandering through the snow, trying to, it was getting dark, so we tried to find a place to stay. And uh, the blinding snow, we saw a uh, light building and small building. We went there and knocked on the door and a man answered and again in our broken English, broken Hebrew. He, he knew, Zev knew about as much Hebrew as I did. And uh, so we asked if we could stay the night and uh, he said, sure, come on in. It was really warm. We, then we, he gave us a couple of couches and we slept there that night. And then the next morning we found out where we were was a, was a, a mikvah. We had stayed in a mikvah overnight and left the next morning. But it was, it was nice and warm, a lot of warm water keeping us warm. Anyhow, so that, that's what took me to Israel. Uh, and uh, it was great. Stayed there for six months. Do you remember the uh, where you were on November 29th, 1947? For the magician plan? 19, that's probably my father's home. Oh, it was my father's home. I didn't go to, no, 1947. For the partition no, plan? No, I was in, it was at school. I was in college. I didn't leave, yeah. I was in, I was in college. I can't remember where, but I heard about it. And it was great, you know. Uh, you know, it was such a contentious thing. It was, you know, Jews were arguing both sides, whether it was enough, too much, you know, there was, uh, there was just so much argument. But, uh, you know, I agree it was a good idea, and I'm sure my father did. Uh, were there other other things that your father was involved in uh, in Zionism in in those days? Was there? I know there are some people who were there were people who were involved politically. There were people who were involved raising money. People involved smuggling weapons. My father knew all the weapon smugglers, but uh, he wasn't one of them. Were there people in Cleveland that were doing that? Yeah, yeah. Actually, the father of a of a uh, one of my 
who became one of my closest friends, a fellow lawyer in Cleveland who subsequently made Aliyah. You may have heard his name, Billy Goldfarb, I know. His father was a was a uh, weapons collector in a, a, a auto repair shop, and he was a depot. <clears throat> I subsequently found didn't know it at the time. He, 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 his garage was a depot for weapons, and then I suppose subsequently transferred to another place and finally made their way to Palestine. But my father wasn't, not to my knowledge, he wouldn't have had any capacity to either collect them or hold them or anything. So, and politically, he had—he was not a politician. He had, he had local Cleveland politics. He was a lawyer, uh, but not politically. Uh, he was outspoken, and he, and he, people thought well of him, so they think well of what he had to argue. But <clears throat> he didn't have any platform like a silver or something like that. And, and Rena Olshansky, her father, was uh, a, a much more learned man, as was her mother. Uh, so they occupied a more national position than my dad and my mother did. Uh, and then as a, later became a official at the Jewish Agency. Uh, so my dad's interest in work was, as I say, in committees. He was a, he was a soldier in the, you know, the ranks of Zionism. When, when did they finally, did they, they got a chance to go to Israel? So they got a chance to go to Israel uh, probably in 54, 55. Uh, and uh, they went. Uh, they go by boat also. Pardon? By boat. No, no, they flew, of course. <laughs> and uh, and uh, you know, my, 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 you know, my, I was in the army at the time, and my father, you know, wrote to me about it and everything. It, it was good for him, but uh, and uh, I think he was satisfied, but. Like so many Zionists of that day who didn't make Aliyah, it was a slightly confusing time. Didn't know exactly what their role was anymore, you know, in the Zionist world, uh, his, you know, Jewish world. You know, was there still a place for them? You know, they subsequently found their place to raise money for Israel. What are they? That's where they all ended up. I don't want to be judgmental, but when you think about it, that's about it. And uh, for those who didn't make Aliyah, and uh, but they, but but they, but and they did, you know, they had a good trip and uh, did all the things that you're supposed to do, you know, and. Uh, and uh, they came back, and I only made one trip, didn't go back again. So... Uh, Did he continue to be involved uh, here? Yeah, you know, and doing, you know, raising money, you know, for Israel. That's what, that's what they did. When did he pass away? In, uh, 60, he died in 1964. Pardon me, 1962, 19, 19, 1962, yeah. 65, yeah, and my mother died two years later, yeah. So, how did, uh, how did this, this collection of things, your father, your mother, your your own uh, trip to Israel early, pretty early, as people, as American Jews, getting a chance to. Yeah. How did it impact on your? How did it impact on your life? How did it impact on your sense of? Uh, well, I, I uh, it affected my life a lot. Uh, I just felt a uh, great comfort in uh, being Jewish. 
Um, like my dad, I was, my brothers, we were very uh, outspoken. I was, still am. But in those days, we were very outspoken with respect to being Jewish, being the right, having the right to be publicly and openly Jewish in every way. And uh, even as late as my college days, being Jewish was not so. It's not such a terrific thing. A lot of still was a lot of anti-Semitism in Cambridge around uh, Jews outspokenly, uh, and uh, every other place. And uh, in answer to that question, I'll give you a little anecdote. In 1967, I was negotiating what for us was a very large transaction for our law firm. and. Uh, one of the meetings was in a conference room of, of my law firm, our law office. And uh, all the rest of the lawyers, and there were a bunch of them in the room, were non-Jewish. I was the only Jew. And they knew it. They knew I was Jewish. Anybody who knew me knew I was Jewish. And the news came in of the victory of the Israelis in 1967. Took the wall took the whole, swept the table. And uh, clearly identified uh, Jewish military might as having the capacity to defend the Jews. And it was clear that they had not only had the capacity to defend the Jews, in the Middle East, but could have the capacity to defend the Jews anywhere. The change, I'm not making this up, the change in the room, in my law office, in the attitude of those lawyers was palpable. I had become a different person. As I say, I'm not making this up. And I believe it continued onwards. So if you ask me, you know, what all of that meant to me, it totally changed my life. Uh, and, uh, you know, so I, I, uh, I measured a lot of things from from 1967 going forward and looking back uh, as to who I was, who my kids were, who my family was, who Jews in America are, Jews throughout the world. 67 was to me and is to me the total turning point. Obviously, Balfour Declaration got the thing going, partition facilitated it and sprung it all loose. 67, that, that's, that's the date in, in my, my registry. And, uh, you know, a lot of people, some people say, well, the Jews and their public relations work, and many Jews were interested in public relations in those 50s and 60s, and with the Gentile community, try to change their feelings toward Jews. <clears throat> but that's not what did it. Those seven days, <laughs> those soldiers in Israel who defended Israel, they changed the Jewish world. Absolutely, I believe it without one shred of doubt. <clears throat> and uh, so it's a different Jewish life for all of us. We may have well been uh, a date of the beginning of decline for American Jewish life, uh, and the fact that we had we we changed from defense to total acceptance. I mean, up to that time, 
Jewish kid getting into a big law firm, big deal, the one that didn't happen often. After that, they couldn't get enough of us. Uh, and the Jewish law firms who were, you know, put together Jews who wanted to practice but couldn't get other jobs. Uh, <laughs> all of a sudden we weren't anymore. My law firm had started off all Jewish partners. <laughs> I got to look around for one now. <laughs> you know, I got 40 lawyers here and I, maybe 10 or 12 of them are Jewish. The rest are not. Don't even think about it hiring anymore. And not, I don't know of anybody else who does. So, if you ask me, you know, what went forward in 67, that's it. And uh, I regret terribly that my father and mother weren't around to see it. That would have been a great day. And my father was, I say, he was out of defense all his life. Fortunately, he was one tough guy, so he could handle himself. Uh, and, but, uh, he would have liked to have seen that day, and he didn't have to anymore. Uh, but as I say, maybe that, maybe it didn't turn out so well after all, because my biggest concern now is I, uh, uh, <laughs> almost at the end of my own run, is uh, the plight of American Jewry. You know, is there going to be enough to keep us going? So it's a big concern of me, of mine. Is there? But getting back to Zionism, what else? No, I, I. Uh, this has been fascinating. Uh, is there is some? Uh... Oh, just a little little sidebar. In 1967, my old son Bruce uh, was becoming bar mitzvah. And my wife, my late wife, and I had planned that we were going to take the whole family to Israel for a, for a month. And we had rented a house, and, <coughs> and we were going to, as I say, right after the bar mitzvah, we were going to take all of us, Bruce and his younger siblings, to, to Israel. Well, the war started, so that the, uh, our visas were no, they, they wouldn't let us they wouldn't let us leave the United States to go to Israel. Finally, uh, they uh, they opened it up. So we got on the first planes, and we were one of the first Americans to get to Israel after the '67 war. So we we got this house in in uh, outside of Tel Aviv, and. Uh, and then we started traveling. We had a car also. So for a month we traveled around. And of course we went through the, all of the land that Israel had captured. You know, we went through the, what became the West Bank, you know, with total immunity, you know. And uh, so it, was, it was a very exciting time, extraordinary exciting time. And for, for me and my wife and for the kids, as much as they could get it. Uh, you know, we'd go into Arab villages and they'd be waving white handkerchiefs and everything to show that they weren't the enemy still. I mean, this was really close after the war. I can't tell you. It was a few weeks. We already had our planes. And uh, we got to, the, to, to Jerusalem and the wall. They had just knocked down the buildings that were facing the wall, so it was huge rubble. So I have pictures of myself and my kids climbing over this rubble to get to the wall. And it was only just about 10 feet, as you remember the configuration that before they took the wall. There was these buildings, and there was about a 10-foot walkway, and then there was the Western Wall. So the buildings were not, they're not Israelis. First thing they did was <laughs> they knocked down those buildings. But there was a huge pile of rubble. So I have this wonderful picture of my youngest son on my shoulders as I'm climbing over the debris, and we're getting to the wall. So it was, as I say, a pretty exciting time. And, uh, and we went, as I say, went through all of now, it's now considered the territories. 
So, uh, so 67 was a great time. Uh, Is there some kind of uh, message, lesson, that you feel that American Jews or Israeli Jews should know about the role that Americans played in the founding of the state? Well, I think that there's never enough knowledge about that. Uh, I think the Israelis, young people ought to know uh, part of their history, Zionism part of their history. Obviously, American Jews should know also part of their pride and identity. But my con concern it, it, along that line right now is the you know, is, is the is the is the continuation, the continuity of Jewish life in America. Uh, as I say, there are no defensive reasons. You know, why one's grandchildren or the children of one's grandchildren should uh, the argument as to why those people, my grandchildren, my great grandchildren, great great grandchildren, should remain Jewish is not always clear and not always uh, present, you know, not presentable, but, but as I say, not, not always clear. Because kids, you know, they ask, you know, why can't we just be good people? Why do we have to be Jews? Uh, I try to put together a package of explanation of why they should be. Uh, but sometimes it, you know, I even ask myself, does it sell too well? You know, I ask people far to the right of me politically, Jewish politically and Jewish observant, observant and Jewish observance. They say, you know, it's all in the Torah. But that, 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 that may sell to some segment, but it's not going to sell to the greater part. Uh, and concerns me. It's, it's, it's poignant to me because just this morning, the very day that you're showing up, I got a Skype from my oldest granddaughter, the apples of my eye. One of them, who has been to Israel many times, got a great Jewish parents, went to Jewish day school to, through grade eight, strong member of BBYO, bakes a great challah, observes all the holidays, uh, loves the Jewish calendar, totally identified with Jewish life, totally. She told me this morning that she's announced the marriage date of her with a Gentile young man. They've been dating for a long time. She feels comfortable with that. Uh, you know, both she and her husband promised that their kids would be raised Jewishly, and I believe them. But the statistics from Steve Cohen say that only 7% of the children of intermarried, uh, of, 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 of intermarried grandparents, only 7% of their grandchildren are going to be identifiably Jewish. And if 50% of American Jews, whatever piece of 50%, are going to be intermarrying or marrying out of the faith, you don't have to have passed third grade math to figure out that's a bad, bad demographic vector. That bothers the hell out of me. And uh, if you ask me about the Israeli asp aspect of that, it's hard for me to imagine Jewish life in America without an Israel. The force of, of their being in Israel, a place where they speak Hebrew, where all the Jewish institutions are the Jewish. So much Jewish history, obviously. But I mean, I'm not even describing it's fishing. It's the site of the Bible. Everything, our canon, everything, our background. Uh, 
So Israel is hugely important to this dialogue that I'm concerned about, this conversation uh, about how to keep our kids Jewish. It's, it, it, the, the role of, of Israel, and, and the kind of Israel it is, is hugely important. If, if Israel, simply put, if Israel isn't a democratic, compassionate, and inclusive place, my grandchildren, or my great-grandchildren, my grandchildren, fortunately, they have a role models and their grandmother and their grandfather and their parents, you know, to, to keep them Jewish irrespective of what kind of a Israel there is. But what about their children and their grandchildren? You know, generations go by in a blink of an eye. If Israel isn't a compassionate and, as they say, inclusive and democratic place, they're not going to want to relate to it. That's not who, that's not who American kids and American Jewish kids are. Uh, you know, I, I, that some of my kids, that all my grandchildren designate <coughs> grants from our family foundation. And I see that the stuff that these kids want to identify, some of them identify with Jewish organizations. They want their grant to go to Jewish. But not the majority of the grants. <coughs> this year, the kids made 10, 10 grants. Majority of them were to just wonderful, wonderful causes, not identifiably Jewish. I would never even think about it. I'm not, it's not true. But. But uh, you know, but I, I, you know, I don't want to read too much in it. But I got to read something into that. So I can much concerned about what kind of place Israel is. And a lot of people come to this office because of the nature of the work I do and who I am, and my responsibilities. You know, asking for support for organizations in Israel. <clears throat> I have five meetings today. You're one of them. Three of them are from organizations, representative organizations in Israel coming here for grants. You know, in of late, last year or two, I've been turning the conversation back to them and asking them, what are you doing for us? You know? Because without your help, I don't know how we're going to make it here. Because we're in big trouble, I believe. And, uh, Without your help, as I say, I don't know how we're going to make it. So if you were willing to, you know, to camp out three summers ago because the prices of uh, cottage cheese was too high, why aren't you camping out and marching now? You know, when they closed down the wall to women or conversion becomes a joke. You know, and, and your government representing you, body politic of Israel, reneges on every promise you make. You know, and you're becoming more rigid and undemocratic and uncompassionate. If you're not compassionate to Arab Israelis, don't tell me that you're compassionate or that you're affected. If I'm being really harsh, don't you tell me that you're Jewish. Because you can't be two those two things. So, so, and that question as to where Israel fits in an American Jewish life, I have great concern. Great concern. Uh, maybe I'm oversensitive to it because I see so many Israelis and I see so much. I'm in Israel a good bit, but uh, I don't like what I see. And like Max Corman, I'm not staying quiet. <laughs> that I inherited from my father. Yeah, among other things. This has been, it's been fascinating. If, only if you're comfortable or, or want to, if you want to say anything about the Myers family or anything. Uh, did you know? Uh, did you know? Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, you're asking me about Myers Fund. David and I has Myers Foundation. Uh, David was a uh, client of mine and a good friend, as as, as were his wife Inez, uh, and uh, they left uh, 
they're, they had a start of the, their foundation before their death. He died in 1999, at the age of 99. Someday I'll meet up with him again and I'll let him know what I think about him not making 100. I had sort of bet on it. And uh, his wife died two years later, also very, in, in well into her 90s. And they had founded this foundation, which was the conduit of their charity. They were both very charitable. And uh, I used to kid him that he only had three great delights in life. One, he loved his wife passionately. And two, he loved to make money because to him it was a challenge. He, he, it was a game. You know, he wanted to collect the most. And he loved to give it away. And uh, so when he felt that he was no longer able to handle it, he turned it over to me. <clears throat> uh, in the late 1990s, I say he died. Died about three or four years later. So I've had the privilege of being the, the uh, steward of his funds. And when he died, he and, and uh, my Nez, blessed memory, died. They left their entire fortune to their uh, to the foundation. <clears throat> they had two uh, young men, Hal and Dieter, who were came to the United States on the kinder transport from Germany, and they uh, became part of the Myers household and changed their name from Hanauer to uh, Myers when they went to school here. <clears throat> and David left them and their families and his and his mother's family very well uh, identified in his uh, estate plan. <clears throat> but the bulk of his fortune went to the, the Myers Foundation. And that's what I, uh, that's how I spend my time now, uh, running that foundation. So, uh, were they Zionists? He, he David was, uh, <laughs> uh, I don't want to be uh, <laughs> too generalized, but he was a, he was a classic German Jew. At, at that time, and he was equivocal about whether Jews should be stepping forward and, you know, arguing for a state of their own and that kind of thing. He, he was doing okay in America, and he figured better to do it quietly than than, than outspoken. Though he he and, and my father knew each other, and he thought well of my dad, and uh, uh, another anecdote that. I've, told on many occasions, including a eulogy at David's funeral. Uh, in 19, what, 20 years before his death, uh, David's lawyer, a marvelous tax lawyer, uh, passed away. And David was looking for a new lawyer. And so he interviewed a number of people. And so one day I get a call from David Myers, and I knew him because he and I had served on a number of boards together, including the hospital board. And uh, so he asked me to come over. I had never been in his office. And he asked me, and, and we, we talked about just, just a few things. And he told me what I was over there for. He was looking for a new lawyer. Okay, that's great. Always could use new business. And uh, he asked me, he, he said, uh, I, knew you, I, I knew your dad. And I, I said, yes, I knew that. I, I knew that. And my father didn't know him well and certainly didn't represent him. And uh, he asked me uh, what did you think of your father? Well, that was a question you wouldn't expect. In an interview about uh, 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 yeah, so Yeah, so we were talking about a lot of things. Somebody said that and they said, what did you think about your father? And I, since I knew exactly what I thought about my father, I said, well, he was the hero of my life. And uh, he thought about that for a while, and it didn't touch the subject again. And uh, a few minutes later, you know, he had enough, and thanked me for coming over, and said, he'll hear from me. 
I'm convinced he didn't tell me that. <clears throat> but about a week later, he called me up and said, I'd like you to represent me and come on over and we'll talk about what I want to do. I'm convinced, and I've said to others, I'm convinced that that answer was what convinced him to hire me. Because you ask about David Myers, the hero of his life was his father. His father and, 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 and his father, his father was strongly Jewish, and and uh, his father was was uh, the treasurer of the uh, Orthodox Jewish Home for the Aged. It was the highest position his father had obtained, but it was a very important organization and hugely important in that community at that time to be the treasurer, and he thought that that was great. David thought that that, was a, that showed what a great man his father was. And his father had started the business that David was in, which was a barrel business in them. And uh, so I didn't know that, but my answer to him about my, my regard for my father was probably, I, I believe, <laughs> got me the, the job of being his lawyer. And then he, he, he lived such a long age that he did, all his friends had passed away, and I was pretty much maybe one of the very few friends that you know still around because I was so much younger than he. And, uh, and then, then he turned his foundation over to me. So our, our, our lives and our fathers, and it's all a you know, little web of circumstance. And, uh, but Dave was a good man, and uh, as I say, he was equivocal about Zionism. After the state, he did go there once, and uh, he uh, made, for then, a substantial gift to the uh, universities in Israel. And uh, of course, then, since then, since I've had it, we're very much involved with Israel. But uh, so that that that's the David Myers Foundation. It's in Cleveland based. We give a lot of support to the Cleveland found, Cleveland community here and national Jewish community, Israel, general community. So we're pretty broad in our interests. And uh, so that's what brings you here. <laughs> and uh, and I, I run a foundation out of my law office here because of the, I just like being here. I don't practice much law anymore. But uh, it's comfortable. It's a place I know. And uh, so works out pretty well. Thank you very much. This okay. Enjoyed seeing you. Thank you. Another question. Just yeah, to, sure. Did you know uh, Frank Rubinsky? That would be Usher Rubinsky's father. I did know Frank well. Usher I knew very well. Frank was, I'm named for Frank. He's my great grandfather. Really? Yeah. Oh. So oh. Usher was my great uncle. Oh, yeah? My grandmother was the youngest. System. Wow. Yeah, Usher, my father hired Usher to work at the at the, the Bureau or the Cleveland Deer School. I can't remember. Where he, he worked there for a while, you know, and then I think he went into his dad's business. I don't, you know, probably know better than I do. But Usher was a great friend of my dad's, and my dad, a friend of Usher, he thought the world of him. And, uh, and I know his, his wife, she, yeah. she's a starker boy. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> That, that whole business of bringing folks over to see concentration camps. <clears throat> wow. She's something else, and she still is. I know. I, I visit her for, uh, during Shiva, so and she's great. We, I, was, I was in Israel, but I, wa I saw her I, I, um, over the internet. I, I saw her speak at the funeral. Yeah. No notes. She's just... Eloquent, and it was amazing. She's a she's a giant. Yeah, yeah she's met boy. Her life has been a real contribution to to yeah to the, to memory. So uh, yeah.
show you this. Uh, I did some speaking while I was here, so I, I had this with me. I just thought this when I interviewed Susie Eben, right, Abba Eben's wife, about it, tell about the time she was at Har he was at Harvard. <laughs> so she was talking about the the partition plan. Yeah. And oh my gosh. And this was the scorecard oh, that they kept track of in. In the UN, look and then that. afterwards, look who's got is it's Chaim Weizmann, Harry Truman. Uh, oh my gosh, he collected here. He did Golda Meyerson. You want me to tell you a story about Golda Meyerson? You might want to put this on. Yeah. This is this is of course this is absolutely fantastic. Oh my gosh, it's just great. Oh. I mean, even without the signatures, with you know, without the yeah, it's it's a it's incredible. Look at his Manion Loom, Eliezer Kaplan. Oh my gosh! I think Abba Hillel Silver's on there. Uh, maybe the Bible. Herzog there. is here. There. Eleanor Roosevelt's on here. Woo! Well, then he was just collecting them. Moshe yeah. Charette. Yeah. Abba Hillel Silver. Ralph Bunch. Yeah. Abba Even, sound of here, I don't know. Yeah. Stephen Wise. Oh my gosh, you got Stephen Wise. How about that? Yeah. Elmer Roosevelt. That. Woo. I don't know who that is. Anyhow, so Zeb Paraman and I, we leave the the uh, <laughs> the uh, mikvah and. And uh, we we don't really, we know we both want to end up in a kibbutz. So uh, as Zev says, well, I, my dad's got this this uh, friend down in uh, Tel Aviv who will help us get out of kibbutz. Okay, so we 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 hitchhike down to Tel Aviv, and uh, he's got the address of his dad's friend. So we we go up. In this apartment building, the address, and knocks on the door. Again, we're knocking on the door, <laughs> and a woman comes to the door. Again, a woman, and he says that he's Zeb Putterman, and his father is again. I can't think of his name. Uh, and she says, "Oh, well, great, wonderful. Come on in. It's gold in my ear." And she takes us into her apartment, and right out of the book, I'm not kidding, gives us two American boys her milk. <laughs> Each got a glass of milk and chocolate chip cookies, you know, served up by Golda Meir. And <laughs> we tell her that we want to go to her kibbutz. She says, okay, let me make a telephone call. So she calls up someone and makes, I wouldn't even pay that much attention. She goes, another call. Finally, she says, okay, I've got you a place up on the Canaret, a place called Ginnisar. Neither one of us had ever heard of the place. And she said, They're, they'll, they'll, they'll take you in. It wasn't that easy to, to, get, to, to do it. They're a little tired of Americans. Uh, so th that's where Zeb and I ended up. So when I see Golda Meir, that's... <laughs> I knew gold in my ear, or she knew me briefly for a moment. Yeah, so uh, but, right. this is, but this is fantastic. Yeah, this is really an artifact. <coughs> All right.